Okay, hi guys, I'm Bree and I'm here to present uh, Rick Ahrens. He is the co-founder and CTO of Ajax.org and he's here to talk about uh, Cloud9. Thank you. Hi everybody, um, I'm Rick Ahrens. I'm CTO of Ajax.org and uh, I've been a C++ developer since uh, 1996. And uh, since then I've uh, gone over to the dark side of uh, JavaScript. Um, and uh, co-founded Ajax.org in 2005, building UI frameworks and uh, consulting. And then um, in 2010, we uh, switched over to building Cloud9 IDE, and uh, that's been our product focus uh, ever since. So um, this is an open source conference. And uh, we're doing a lot with open source. So I wanted to highlight um, the different parts of Cloud9 uh, that have uh, been open sourced. There is uh, the editor, the code editor, called ACE, HX.org Cloud9 Editor. Um, this is a separate component, um, a DOM-based um, code editor written in JavaScript, really, really efficient and fast. and um, it has replaced the Bespin project, which used to be a canvas-based editor from Mozilla, as their primary code editor. So we're now working together with Mozilla with a lot of developers and a great open source community to create the best code editor in the browser. And it's been used in a lot of other projects as well. Um, I'll show you the site in a bit. Then there's Cloud9 IDE. Um, it's a Node.js backend that you can um, run from your own machine. I'll show you that in a bit. You can pull it off GitHub and run it and use it as a Node.js IDE on your local machine, essentially. And then there's our hosted version, c9.io or cloud9ide.com. And um, there the whole thing lives in the cloud. You can develop your software and um, it's free for open source projects. So it's a really, uh, really cool service. Um, I'm going to show how to develop a small Node.js application, a little hello world in, in Cloud9. Let me do that. So first, the code editor Ace, it has its own page, ace.ajax.org. And uh, to give you a very quick overview, I can open the live demo here just to show you what Ace is. As you can see, it's a syntax highlighting uh, code editor that you can use just like TextMate or um, I think it also has Vim key binding, so just like Vim's um, as well. And um, it's got all sorts of fancy um, JavaScript processing here. You can see that it's now giving me errors and uh, showing what I'm doing wrong. One of the key features for building this editor was performance. Um, if, you if you're making a code editor in a browser, um, you want it to be equal or better than any of the editors uh, people are used to work with. So um, it scales quite nicely. If you can just uh, put many thousand li of lines of code in here, it doesn't matter if it's 10,000 or 100,000, you can still work with it. Um, it doesn't slow down editing in the middle. You can still use your um, keyboard navigation just fine. So this editor is um, a separate project with its own um, syntax highlighters and, and colors, um, themes, and all these things. And you can use this for your own project. Let's see here. Um, Here's a list of projects that are using ACE already. Of course, our own IDE, and then many other open source and not open source projects. Um, and then there's Cloud9. Cloud9 is the whole IDE. I haven't shown you, but I'll show you in a bit. And you can pull it off GitHub. It's on ajax.org slash cloud9. And if you pull it all, you can essentially start it using a shell command, and it will run a small node server, as you can see, um, serving the IDE locally. And this is then what the IDE looks like locally. 
as a local host IP and the port. And uh, here's the editor, as you saw, separate, but now part of the IDE with the same themes, all these kind of different, different configurations. Um, I'm not going to show you the local one. I'm going to show you the online one. But this stuff is all GPL. You can pull it and use it to develop little Hello World node applications. Or We use it to develop Cloud9 itself, um, both the local and the online version. This is a really cool way of um, using your code because essentially you get almost instant recursion on your um, development cycle. All our developers are using this app to build this app. So that means that if anything is annoying them or um, pissing them off, as it's called, then um, the bug gets priority. And that's a really nice way of prioritizing. So let me show you the online version. Um, here we go. So you can sign in using your GitHub account um, or make a new user here. And then you go to your project view. I'm going to create a new project here. And let's see, demo two. And I'm going to create an open source project, which is free. There we go. I can open the IDE. Um, I'll have to make a new file. Let's make a JavaScript file. Demo.js. There we go. And let's make it say something. Save it. And now I can run it. Add a new run configuration. I just started a small node application, which did absolutely nothing except print something on the console um, in the cloud. This whole app you can run on um, Chrome OS or just a web-based machine without any local access at all. Um, so here's the little console. This is the, the text output. Um, there's also a small Unix console right here you can use to um, use Git or use your local com uh, your uh, Unix commands to do stuff with your source. So I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Node.js. I'm seeing a couple of people know, but so I'm going to show you a, a very very simple um, hello world for Node. And I'll open the Node.js site here. As you can see, it shows you already a very simple hello world here, how to make a small web server. Node.js is a V8 JavaScript engine running on the server um, with an asynchronous I.O. stack. So essentially everything you do is non-blocking and asynchronous, which is a really um, interesting way of uh, working because you don't have any top-down code flow anymore, which is, takes getting used to. But people that were used to browsers and events in browsers, it's a pretty close comparison. Um, so let's make a little HTTP server. Um, HTTP.create server. And I'm going to give it a callback with a request and response object. So, and now I have to make it listen. Um, and because it's online, I have to use a special variable to give it a port, because you can't just bind any port on the cloud version. Um, and let's say that we're online. Now it's doing absolutely nothing. So I have to write a little bit of code to respond to an HTTP request. Um, let's do um, response.writehead and give it a 200 always. And then say, hello world HTTP. Now this looks pretty, pretty sane. I should be able to run this. We are online, so I can click on this link. As you can see, I've just started a little HTTP server online that is running my code. Um, 
this code to be exact. Now to give it a little bit more dynamic, let's um, give it a variable. Variable that says how many times we've loaded this page since I started the server. Uh, counter, zero. Let's add one up here. And let's show the counter in the response. Let's restart the little server. Load it up. There we go. Now that's strange. I'm loading it once, but it's counting it twice. What could that be? Let's investigate. Let's see what the URL is on the re request object. Request, request.url. Let's see what this spits out in our console here. Okay, restart it. Ah, as you can see, the browser finds it really not fun to try to load your fav icon. So that's why it ca it's counting it twice. Every time I refresh, I get a request for the fav icon as well. So let's make sure that we don't count them. Let's only do the root. And then we execute this code. And otherwise, we're going to be an invalid HTTP server and do absolutely nothing, which is fully illegal, but it works. There we go. That looks more like it. Now, um, I can also debug this code. The server is now running. It's live. So I can put a breakpoint here. Let's refresh. Oh, it's not loading. It hit a breakpoint. Now, this is... Um, pretty normal for people from the .NET space and uh, uh, C++ development. But for dynamic languages and web IDEs, this is a pretty new thing to be able to fully debug your application as it's running on the server. So um, I can now do stuff like inspect this variable. Oh, I have to scroll down. So I can execute JavaScript in the context of where my breakpoint is now, just like you're used to with Firebug except now for server-side JavaScript. Let's do something with this counter. Let's set it to 1,000. OK, so now I modified the state of the live server process. Um, and let's continue. Let's see what it shows here. There we go. You can see that the state is fully maintained, and I can debug all this stuff. Now, this is extremely useful, especially when your code gets more complex. Uh, when printf debugging, as you use for your console, um, hits limits, um, it's really nice to be able to use a full debugger for your server. And for writing Cloud9, which is, I think, I don't know if it's the most complex Node server-side process, but it's probably close, since it's not, Node is fairly new. Um, it's really, really helpful to be able to debug everything inside the system. You also have your, uh, your call stack, which is uh, kind of fun. Let me put in a new breakpoint shows you a little bit under the hood of Node. Um, as you can see, I can now browse into the internals of Node.js. Node.js has all these libraries that make it do this stuff. Um, it's not written in C. The, um, the HTTP wrappers and all these um, APIs that Node ha has is, are not written in C. They're bound to some C, but most of it is JavaScript. And you can see that you can um, go through the entire stack here. So this is um, the entry point for, for Node that, you know, there's a readable socket and it fires the unreadable. And um, then there's data. I don't know what the hell this is, but then we get an event and then we're here in our code. So you can also debug all the way down into Node.js. Um, the debug API that we're using is actually the V8 uh, JSON uh, protocol. So we can also debug Chrome with the same debugger. Um, Google is working on a, a WebSocket API for uh, their debugger, so we can connect directly with Cloud9 to uh, a running Chrome process, and then you can do front-to-back JavaScript debugging in both the server and the client space. Um, we're also working on Ruby support for the debugger. Um, 
which is a different protocol with the Ruby debugger. You get everything on your standard out, so you have to filter that. Working on that, uh, Python is again slightly different than PHP, but they follow the same kind of principle as uh, as Ruby. So uh, we're working on connectors there. If anybody here is um, Ruby God or you know really good at Python, um, please you know come talk to us because we need some of that. Um, genius on on those uh, those things as well um, so this is the the IDE itself um, you can write code you can write HTML JavaScript uh, write node servers and debug them um, and soon we'll get um, um, the real-time collaboration in the editor as well just like Google Docs you can use use it with multiple people um, there's a git UI coming up with uh, a very nice branch merge uh, type of uh, visual visual view on Git. Right now, um, I am I have to work with this Git at demo.js Git commit uh, first. There we go. So now you have to just use the command line for Git, which is fine um, if you want to interact with GitHub. So, um, yeah, I think this is the the demo part. I wanna I wanna go into a um, bit more the conceptual space of writing your code in the cloud and what does it mean for um, developers and what what can we do in the future. Um, let's see. Uh, turn off mirroring. Presentation, play. So, Cloud9 is an IDE, as you've seen, that is, has many features that people are used to from desktop IDEs and uh, some new features for, um, um, for the web. But what is, what is the cloud part of this? So, where are we going with that? Why will we, will we develop software in the cloud? What is the benefit there? Um, and maybe uh, useful to also stop at what this cloud thing is, because everybody's saying cloud, and is there any um, structure to what it means? Well, um, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure um, there is consensus here on, uh, in, in many areas, depending a bit on which business you ask what cloud means, because everybody says they're doing cloud, but it means something. Right, so before we had virtualization, now we have cloud. Are they the same things? I don't think so. Um, the cloud is the next step up from virtualization. So um, with virtualization, we could stop caring about hardware. Um, the, the server would be in the rack. You didn't have to care about it. You got a VM on there, and you could just install your software. You didn't have to physically install your operating system on the hardware anymore. So. But you still had to care about the operating system. Just with Amazon now, you you know you get a VM, but you still have to care um, what operating system. So you're still a system administrator that has to install MySQL, make sure that it's not having security holes and all these kind of things that, as a developer, you rather not want to worry about. Um, so you're very aware of every server and the whole operating system space and virtualization. Now, what is cloud? With cloud, you essentially put a layer on top of pre-installed software like MySQL or um, you know, Python runtime engines or these type of installed software where the standard is an API. So as a developer, you move up to the level of SDKs and APIs and not of installing databases and configuring language runtimes. With that SDK, which is on top of the pre-integrated software stack, you don't even have to worry about keeping all these servers up to date because that's what your cloud service provider is gonna do for you. All you have to do is write your code against the SDK and deploy to the cloud platform. Um, so there's a lot of confusion what cloud means and everybody uses it for the same different stuff. Um, but if you look at the AAS type of naming, there are two things, um, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. So 
essentially a platform as a service usually lives on an in infrastructure as a service and um, the infrastructure as a service is more uh, a VM automation space. So you might get an API to fire up new VMs. It doesn't help you at all with installing your software. Um, you can pre-configure those VMs, sure, but you still need to update them and still need to manage them. And on the other hand, you have platform as a service, and this is what I think should be called cloud, and that's the, um, the API layer that people can use. Um, the promise of the cloud is that you don't have to worry about all this stuff anymore as a developer. You can just write your code, deploy it to a cloud platform, and it will scale, and it will work, and you don't have to upgrade and update um, your systems. This means storage, database, and computation, and bandwidth. Um, this is mostly still a promise. There are very few companies that actually have cloud APIs that work, uh, or they're experimenting with what it should be. Uh, Google App Engine is one of the leading guys in, in, uh, in having uh, an API there that works, but Heroku is also quite far with this. And there are others coming up all the time. So maybe, um, as you're all developers, this is a superfluous analogy, but let's say you have a box of books and you want to store it. Before virtualization, you had to worry about building a shed, making sure that the roof didn't leak and that the door set locks. Now with virtualization, the shed is a given but you still need to manage the space inside. You need to put up shelves and have to store it yourself. With the cloud, essentially you get a guy or a robot that you give the box of books and will fetch it for you when you ask for it. That's the level of service that we're moving the software stack up to with cloud. So what makes it useful? Besides, of course, uh, less overhead and maintenance and upgrades. And that's scaling. Imagine you're building a social application and you start with a few users. You're running a normal VM or instance at Amazon and now suddenly Justin Bieber of all people tweets about your app and you get eight million screaming teenage girls trampling your server in virtual space. Whether this fits your business model is or not is irrelevant because your server is going to be toast. You have to scale your backend resources rapidly. You have to fire up new instances, you have to configure load balancers, and then you didn't even take into account that your technology that you use to actually run the app has to scale as well. You can't just scale. You have to make sure that your database can be duplicated horizontally. You have to make sure that your code uh, scales horizontally, doesn't have any uh, interconnections or any problems there. Most applications with any type of social structure will not do this because they essentially exist on being a nexus of information sharing between its users. So you have to really think it through. It's a difficult engineering question. And that makes it a nightmare, and not because of Justin Bieber. So the cost of scaling and architecting your app before you know your app is going to be successful is very, very expensive right now. And um, if there's going to be a lot, of more, a lot more apps that explore the market and can be successful when they get successful, then we need this cloud infrastructure to support these kind of spikes in popularity. Cloud infrastructure solves this problem with a special API so that it sort of forces your uh, architecture of your app to be scaling independent uh, by providing a certain database API, by providing essentially storage APIs so that you don't write to a local file system anymore. These type of APIs will force you to write your app in a way that it can scale. And by enabling this out of the box, you can scale from one to millions um, without the cost of preempting it or uh, the loss of failure when your web app gets popular. In short, the cloud will save time and money, and developers can focus on how to make their apps better and not you know, worry about all these system architecture and um, essentially system maintenance uh, problems that you have to do now. So I think the cloud is going to be a very good thing for software developers in a global market. So what does it mean for developing apps? Cloud platforms come with SDKs, and you have to install these on your PC and hope that everything will be the same locally as it is online. Um, let's give an example. With App Engine, you have a database called Bigtable that you use internally, and it lives in the Google Cloud. But for your SDK, you get a stop that's sort of working, but not entirely, because you cannot really pull the SDK out of the cloud. The cloud is an infrastructure that is pretty big for, uh, that you can use, and it's very difficult to run that locally. 
So in the future, we believe that software development for the cloud is going to happen on that cloud. And you don't have any differences in local and online. You can just develop your code online and run it there. You can run, test, and debug on an online platform. And that's where um, our vision with Cloud9 comes in, that also your development environment does not have to live on your own computer. Um, it can live in the cloud with a seamless experience to your local, local space. We're also working on a local version um, that uses uh, offline support and can sync and these kind of things to give you a very um, smooth transition to, to the online environment. So you can develop your application, run and debug it in the same environment that you'll eventually deploy to online. That also means that you don't have to install these SDKs anymore. You can start right away. The cycle is very short. You can change the code and press run. You can test against real systems, not mockups. And it makes the life of developers a lot better, and especially a lot less time is spent in downloading, installing, maintaining, and these kind of things. Um, we're integrating Cloud9 with a couple of different cloud providers right now, and you should be able to try this soon. Um, but there are more benefits to having your code and environment online. Take this um, imaginary scenario. You're a developer and you join a new company. A year ago, they developed an app, and the customer calls because they heard of this great new thing called Google Motion, um, which is the latest in April 1st technologies, and they really want it, um, and you have to add it to your existing app, right? So, um, however, for you to safely do this, you need the entire development environment that they use to build that app. You need the testing VMs, you need the databases, you need all the code, you need a huge amount of information to even be able to add this little block of HTML probably that goes with this great feature. So um, all these development companies have all different processes for this. You know, they have DevOps that have all sorts of VM farms that manage this for you. Hopefully, if it's a smaller shop, usually you're lost and you're going to hack it on live systems or, you know, just figure it out yourself. So you have to find your way into this. You have to talk to lots of people, depending on the organization size. You can spend weeks talking to ops, getting this sort of figured out, how you're going to do this, endless meetings. So before you know it, you spend ages to recreate basically this environment to have some sort of sane process before you can develop and release a very small change. Um, now, that's really terrible. So this is... However fictional this example, this is very much a reality for, for developers right now. Um, and unless a project is essentially a live project that is in continuous development, you're going to have to find ways to get these things back together. And uh, with development in the cloud, you can put all, that, all those settings behind you know, a single login, a single environment, and you can pull the entire state of all your tools, your deployments, your processes out and change something, push it back, and it works. You could do that from your iPad because you don't have any state to download to your machine. You could put it behind a URL. So that makes developers happy, customers happy, and CFOs also very happy because it costs a lot less unless they're billing. So you can extend the app, run some automated tests on your cloud test farm, which runs it through all sorts of browsers, clicking somewhere and all these paths that have been recorded in the previous process. And you can add a bit of test for the new code, add it to the testing, and it goes through. You click rollout and it's online. Um, and this is because you don't spend time on any of the useless stuff. Now, developers are very um, scarce, scarce resource globally, as most people know because they can probably easily find a job anywhere they want. Um, that means that we have to make people more efficient in this process, because there's weeks and weeks lost on relatively short projects on just this process. Now there's another big thing in the cloud, and that's called collaboration. Um, and there are lots of challenges associated with that as well. If you look at the world, you can see it's one big collaborative effort in itself. There's buildings, governments, businesses, everything is a collaboration. And nature has shaped it in a particular way that is apparently efficient. So let's take an example of these kids building a sandcastle. 
If you need to do something simple, such as making a big pile of sand, everybody can work freely with a common goal in an easily parallelizable process. Um, and they'll optimally do the same thing. Now, after they finish this pile of sand, uh, the dynamic starts to change. The task will have to start splitting up. Somebody has to dig the trench, other builds the towers, and these kind of things. It's also where usually kids get into fights with building sandcastles. So it turns into task separation, and it's completely domain specific for sandcastles, even. Um, so when one kid starts to argue, you usually get into a fight. Um, I don't think he really hates it, just that he has a task conflict with that other little kid there. So um, there's a lot of difficulty in collaboration. And fundamentally, I think there's no single route. Um, every task has different parameters, and it even changes on the phase of your process. So with development, everybody is used to, pretty much used to by now, working with source control as a way of collaborating on software. This is a very remote way of collaborating. You're working on your own code, and somebody else is working on theirs, and then you merge, and you argue, and you blame. There's a special button for that. And then you continue on that same process. But I think with the cloud, we're going to get access to the whole range of collaboration in between sitting next to each other and doing something together and source control. Uh, for Cloud9, we're figuring out ways for developers to more actively work together whilst avoiding the frustration, frustrations. Um, having an IDE in the cloud opens up new ways of development. For instance, interactive code reviews with distributed teams or helping and training developers by really quickly being able to access their environment. Um, you could just, you know, it's a URL, it's one click away. If they're stuck, you can make them unstuck in a matter of seconds or minutes, depending on how stuck they are. But at least it's, it can be highly optimized. Um, and uh, yeah, we no longer have to rely on inventions like this for pair programming. So um, let's say you have a remote team working on a project. Uh, with Cloud9, you can then have the ability to share your work environment and uh, we're doing that as well in our office. We have a couple of people spread around the US and Europe, but the core team is in Amsterdam. Very often somebody stuck, has a problem, can figure it out, has a bug. And, um, and it's really handy to be able to work together on that code in the same state. So um, as your project is behind a URL with your user, um, everything is there. So you can share the space, join, in on the same development environment and even have the whole debug state synced so you can work together through the process. It's no longer it works on my machine. Well, you know, the machine is now that cloud thing, so it's shared. Um, and with a colleague on the other side of the world, um, these kind of things become very tedious. You have to do it over Skype or over any type of screen sharing. Uh, you can do it much more efficiently, especially if you can go into a dynamic with, which is similar to Google Docs for editing code and uh, annotating it and do, do all these kind of things. So um, within the project, you can communicate directly with chat. You can do an audio call. Um, you could do co-writing. And um, the person you invited can run it, can debug it. It's, it's like a, a shared system without being in each other's space. Um, and he doesn't have to simulate it. I've reached the end of my presentation. Um, I wonder how much time I used up. But uh, this was a bit about the future, where we're going. I've showed you where we are right now. Um, we have a lot of open source projects, so if you're interested in, in uh, contributing and joining, please do. Um, it's on GitHub. Um, we're on Freenode, on IRC, um, and on Twitter. We have a mailing list as well. Um, you, can, you can try it for your own open source projects on c9.io, and we'll be adding other languages besides JavaScript uh, soon. Um, so I want to thank you for your attention. And if probably have 15, 20 minutes left, so if there's questions, I'd be happy to take it.
matching your experience with the Google uh, app engines? Um, it's evolving. I think right now the deployment cycle is too slow for App Engine, um, and they need to improve a couple of other things, um, such as um, if you want to fully do this right, you have to be able to run and debug as well. And for that, they need a couple of extra features. Um, but we're talking to them about this, and they seem very open and interested to explore this. But um, yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of growth left in the whole uh, cloud space for uh, platform as a service and also very much for App Engine. So, um, yeah, I mean, I could think of uh, many improvements I would want to see in App Engine, but fundamentally, first, I would like to see a much tighter dev cycle. What's the largest team work that you have done or what you have seen on the cloud right now? I think, uh, well, our company is about 15 people. So usually it's about three, four people that are on the same space because if the team gets bigger than that, you will start uh, be in each other's way. So then it's better to separate concerns. Um, yeah. Then the other question is how, in your deployment, how do you deploy an application out to the, uh, whatever, wherever your app engine might be at? Or do you expect um, the app engine to be running on, on, on your uh, cloud line already? No. Um, the idea is that you have your code and your um, some of the run environments. For, for, for Node.js, we now have our own run environment, run and debug environment. But we want to focus on integrating with um, platforms that we push the code to and also run and debug eventually. That's in the, in the pipeline. So we would not run our own um, app engine. We would push it to app engine. You would enter your username and password for App Engine or your SSH key, and you, you'd publish to, to App Engine. The, uh, the uh, debugger is very interesting. The, the uh, breakpoint is very, very interesting. Um, so is the breakpoint capability only available for, uh, for, for the uh, Node.js uh, Node right now? Right now, yes. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a protocol. It's a JSON-based protocol. So we're working on wiring it up to many other environments. Um, I mean, that's, that's essentially the essence of uh, the most complex integrations that we have to do with cloud platforms is making sure that these um, debugging services can be connected up to the IDE. It's just a matter of routing. It's, it's a JSON stream, so you can just route it. So when do you estimate the time for this to work with Um can give you a date on that, but it's it's in very active progress. Like, like by the end of the year. Definitely by the end of the year, but if it's in, 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 in two or four or six months, I, I cannot really tell you. deal with uh, security and privacy issues with having your code in the cloud? Well, in a, in a very similar way as um, GitHub does it. So you have private repos and you have public repos. And private repos are not publicly accessible. They're in the cloud space. Um, and as far as the cloud providers that you publish to, um, yeah, that's really a matter of the cloud providers. Um, it's pretty secure. It's, you know, they're big uh, SSL-based um, platforms with SSH keys to do the security. So is SSH secure? Well, not always. But um, in general, these things are very similar to, you know, Gmail, um, Amazon, uh, GitHub, those kind of things. What's the uh, largest application you guys have running that has been built on Cloud9? Cloud9. Well, um, besides Cloud9, I think the drop is pretty steep still because we just launched uh, effectively, what is it, six weeks or four weeks ago. Um, so we have the feeling that if it can take Cloud9, then it can take very big projects. So that, that's our nice benchmark. What 
kind of uptake are you seeing so far? Uh, quite a lot, actually. I think we're hitting 17, 18,000 signups since launch. Is that mostly open source or is that closed source? Um, a lot of people are experimenting with it just to see, you know, uh, how it works. And um, is, there's a lot of closed projects, but also a lot of open source. It's it's going to be a balance. So when you're working with Cloud9, as far as the software stack goes, do you just have an exhaustive list of all the different resources, like Obama, or PHP? Is that is everything already set up, or just do you have like a pick and choose list of things that you want? To um, well, right now we do Node.js run and debug. Um, if you if you use the uh, open source local version, you could command line run anything really with it. But um, for the online version, it's going to be uh, we have to support it. We have to support the Ruby uh, environment. We have to support Python environments. Yes, so that's a work in progress. Yeah. You'll, you'll collaborate uh, for that collaborative uh, uh, design system right now. You had mentioned earlier uh, that uh, you had an issue with you know, writing code you for the Skype or something like that to share screens. Um, how about some, uh, I don't know, you're thinking, have you been thinking about using maybe like the, the Google uh, Doc type capability to uh, get interactive? Uh, Definitely. Um, we have a, a Google Doc, Doc type. Um, it's operational transforms, they call them, to have uh, like a collaborative editing experience. Um, we have a collaborative er editing experience that's probably better than that right now in our tests. Um, we didn't launch with it because we got a huge amount of people on our servers and it is an extra bit of server load so we were a bit hesitant in uh, um, crashing ourselves by pushing it out too soon but that will be out very soon. Multiple cursors uh, yeah. type editing, yeah. All right, um, I guess that's it. So um, thank you all for your attention.